Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Father, again, we stand in your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Just grateful for the opportunity that you've given us to feast upon your word or just to think about it. It is my prayer that you would just take and strip away all foolishness and ignorance, but seal to our hearts only that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. If you've been following along in these videos on Romans, verse by verse, I want to just take a moment to thank you for all of the feedback and all of the encouragement that you have given me uh, as we've gone through uh, these few chapters. We're now in about the fourth chapter of Romans. Uh, I did 33, I believe, videos on Ephesians. I welcome you to uh, listen to those as well. But we're now approaching uh, about the 30th video or just under 30 videos here in Romans. And I spend quite a bit of preparation time, study time um, in these videos. And uh, at the last video, I believe we were, we were somewhere around verse 13 of chapter 4. And the theme of the epistle is really going to change very shortly. We've uh, we've seen that in throughout this study, we've seen that man is totally depraved, that there is none righteous, no, not one. Uh, when we look at modern Christianity, it really does seem as though we have people who, Christians who believe in predestination, without predestination, sovereignty, without sovereignty, total depravity, without total depravity. And I'm not sure how they mix all of that, how they reconcile all of that. We've had a, uh, a tremendous amount of scripture and discussion that man is in himself evil, absolutely unable to remedy his condition, that he's spiritually dead. And so we come down to verse 13. And now we've been introduced to Abraham. And Abraham is declared to be the father of us all. That we're told that God made him righteous. He called him. Uh, remember what we're going to see in Romans chapter 8, I know that's jumping ahead, but many of you are familiar with the text, that whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, conformed to the image of his son, and those whom he did predestinate, he called, and those whom he called, he made righteous. Now, folks, there aren't any slips in that sieve. There, there isn't anybody that slipped out. All of those who he foreknew, he called, and all of those whom he called, he made righteous. Now, we know that Abraham was called out of uh, Ur of the, of the Chaldees. We know that God made him righteous. And because he was righteous, not his old totally depraved Abraham, but the Abraham made righteous through the grace of God, believed God. And now we're told that he is the father of all those that believe. Of course, you have a bunch of people before Abraham, and I mean, and there are some who have suggested, well, that, that means from Abraham, from Adam to Abraham, nobody went to heaven. You can't say that. Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. 
God made sacrifice for Adam's sin in type, we believe it clearly indicates that Adam was made righteous. But all of a sudden, God is pointing out in Abraham that the way this works is because they're his children. They were children of God before Abraham ever lived, before he was ever born. And how does the process work? It works because God foreknew, predestinated, called, and made righteous. It is righteous people, people who have been made righteous by the obedience of Jesus Christ, not their own obedience, who can believe, and Abraham is called the father of all who believe. And that is whether they be Jew or Gentile. I've, uh, I've pointed out the marvelous truth of the Word of God that Christ was made sin for us the one the Christ, the Christ who was made sin for us was after that made perfect and we have suddenly delved into the greatest resource or nuances of biblical truth that Christ who was made sin did not continue to be sin because we know that with great crying and tears he made intercession and he was heard being made perfect and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation. Underline that word author. Now, the covenant made with Abraham, which I think is, is the covenant or covenants, however you want to look at it. I think it was one covenant expressed in different ways, but it is easily looked at as several covenants. I think are all embodied in the promise that he should be heir of the world. That could be the earth, that could be the new Jerusalem, which, uh, as we know from Revelation, it comes down from heaven or out of heaven. We see that in the book of Revelation. That could be the universe. I mean, I'll leave that. Uh, up to you folks to decide. I think it's embodied in the word kingdom that we are an heir and we will inherit the kingdom. It was not to Abraham or to his seed singular. We need to pay attention to the grammar and we know from Galatians that it was Christ the covenant was really made with Christ. The covenant was made with Abraham, but the ultimate covenant was made with Christ. It was not to Abraham or his seed singular by means of law, but by means of faith's righteousness. It's the righteousness that belongs to faith. There's a genitive there, faith's righteousness. If all that God predetermined was based upon the tenuous possibility of your faith or my faith, it's a pretty sad situation. Christ was faithful, we are told, and it's the faithfulness of Christ that made us righteous. It's the faithfulness of Christ that makes the promise absolutely certain. That covenant was not, was not to Abraham or to his seed, and that ultimate seed is Christ. It was not by means of law. My Bible says through the law. There's no definite article. It was not by means of the law, but by means of faith's righteousness. This is what the text says. It's a genitive. 
And the genitive could be subjective or objective. It could, uh, it could be the faith that results in righteousness. Or it could be righteousness, which is a result of faithfulness. Now, the popular opinion today, of course, is that, is that you are made righteous if you accept Christ. If you don't, well, then, of course, the liability is upon you. So, and this is usually the, where I, I, many of you will take leave of me here. Most Bible teachers say, as though the entire purpose and plan of God, uh, you know, well, from before time began, as if it's based upon something that you may or may not do, that would not make the covenant, folks, it would not make the covenant and the promise absolutely certain to all the seed. Maybe to some of it. Maybe to some of it. Personally, I doubt even to some of it, but surely not to all of it. It was not through law, but by means of the righteousness of faith. Why was the law given then? Why was the law given? We're told why the law was given. It was given that the transgression might be made manifest until the seed come, until that faith comes, which we see in the book of Galatians. And that's in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. It was by means of faith's righteousness. For if they which are of the law be heirs, the faithfulness is made void, and the promise is made of none effect. The faith is made meaningless, and it's a, it's a perfect passive, and the promise is made of no effect. It's annulled. It's a null. Uh, Katergatai, I believe, is the word in the Greek. It's a perfect passive, absolutely and totally made void and annulled. It's a first-class condition. It could absolutely be translated, since they which are of the law be heirs, the faith is made meaningless. And the promise is annulled. Now, we can say that assuming this is true, then the result is true. If, if you go back, if you go back to uh, chapter 2, verse 13, chapter 2, verse 13, we've already plowed through this field. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, are righteous before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Well, let's go over uh, to 26 and 27 of chapter 2. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision and shall not uncircumcision, which is, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge the who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law, for he's not a Jew who, who is one outwardly. We've already gone through that. That was presented as a possibility. And then, but but then absolutely devastated in chapter 3. There isn't anybody that ever fulfilled the law, ever, ever. So now we come to the conclusion, if what we said in chapter 2 is true, then faithfulness is meaningless. Now listen. 
this is, I believe, extremely important. If you are faithful in keeping the law, according to chapter 2, verse 13, you'd be righteous. So faith can't be meaningless. Depends on how faithful you are under the law. But if the faith, articulated faith, faithfulness in verse 14, is that of Christ, then the verse makes sense. A great percentage of Christianity takes faith in verse 14 as your personal faith, your personal faith. But your personal faith could work great under law. And if you kept the law, if you kept the law, it should not be rendered meaningless. Do you, do you follow what I'm saying here? You were faithful in keeping the law. The faith or the faithfulness of verse 14 has to be the faithfulness of Christ. It has to be. You have it worded differently in Galatians 4. For if there had been a law given, which could have rendered righteousness, Christ died in vain. His death is rendered meaningless. That's what this verse is saying. That is what the text is saying. That, that if we took the conclusion of chapter 2, faithfulness of Christ is meaningless. And, and, and why should God make a covenant with Abraham? That's also meaningless. If righteousness come by the law, and no, no such law was ever given, clearly we are told by the Holy Spirit in Galatians, in the epistle to the Galatians, a law was never given to make anybody righteous. It never was given to make anybody righteous. It was given because of the transgression. There's a powerful truth in verse 14. It's the faithfulness of Christ. And that's what the text has been arguing since, well, since the middle of chapter 3. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, having been justified freely by His grace. Nobody seems to want to quote that these days. It's a righteousness of God revealed separate from the law, separate from the law. And it's based upon, it's based upon, the faithfulness of our Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the most powerful arguments is the 14th verse. For if they which are under the law are the heirs, then the finished work of Christ is meaningless. Christ died for naught. We're told in Galatians and you wouldn't want to do that. The, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ is not meaningless. Folks, I don't really this is where I wonder why, why am I doing this? I, I don't really know what words to use. Galatians 3 chapter 3 starting at verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just, that is the righteous, shall live by 
faith, and the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Turning back to chapter 1, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you. Many of you know what I'm talking about. And would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. As we said before, so I say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. Those are powerful verses. What was the gospel that Paul preached? Jesus Christ died for your sins. I delivered unto you the gospel. Jesus Christ died for our sins, not everybody's, ours. And he was buried, so the sins were carried away, and he rose from the dead because he was made perfect. Bear in mind, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he was made sin for you and for me. That you might be, and that I might be made the righteousness of God in him. What happened to that sin? I don't know. What I do know is with strong crying and tears in the garden, he prayed that the cup that he was presently drinking would come to an end that he would not be eternally made sin. And when I get to Hebrews, I read with most profound attention that with strong crying and tears, he made intercession and he was heard, being made perfect. I don't know how God removed that guilt from Christ that had been mine. But I know he did, and he became the author of eternal salvation. The author, folks. We seem to want to make man the author of eternal salvation when it was Christ. Christians brush past that word author with few really understanding the import of that word, that one single word. He was both the beginner and the ender of our faith. And it's his faithfulness that would be rendered meaningless if the process came by law. I believe that to be crucially important. There are so many who believe that you must accept Christ and, and, then, and then repent and be sorry, be, be baptized, be, be circumcised, join a church, worship on Saturday instead of Sunday, celebrate Christmas or don't celebrate Christmas. I mean, who knows? All the things that people add to the finished work of Christ. And adding one thing, one thing, adding one thing to the finished work of Christ makes it meaningless and annuls the promise. 
Modern Christianity has placed the cart before the horse. And if you find that a difficult concept to grasp, I'm sorry to say you don't really understand the message of this book. And most likely, most likely, what you've done is you've based your entire system of belief on a religious system that has seduced the masses into believing that one goes to heaven based upon something that they do. When this book screams out, that is not the case, that that is not the case at all. I almost wonder whether what I'm trying to preach ever makes any sense. Your messages of encouragement keeps me going week after week. I spend an average of 14 to 16 hours preparing for just one of these Romans verse by verse videos. The gospel is not popular among Christians today. I'm talking about Christians who, who, who belong to Christ, who only belong to Christ because of what Christ did, not something that they did. And it's not popular to them. The very gospel by which they say they are saved is not is not popular to them. Your being made righteous is not dependent upon anything you did. If it is, it's not of grace. And to preach that it is is another gospel. And folks, that terrifies me. Let him be accursed. We are all the children of promise. And as it was then, so it is now. They which are born after the flesh persecute them that are born after the spirit. You want to know why I'm frustrated a lot? It's because of that. But God sustains us. Nevertheless, what saith the scriptures? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. Power, powerful language, extremely powerful language. You are not redeemed because you did anything. You're not redeemed because you believe. You believe because you're redeemed. It's just exact the exact reverse. It is the grandeur of the finished work of Christ. We preach Christ, not self. I am persuaded that the great bulk of Christianity is much more concerned about what you ought to do for God than what God has done for you. And this book, this Word of God that we treasure is a revelation of what God has done for us. The marvelous truth that he who knew no sin was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. How righteous is that? By the time we get to the fifth chapter, and, and we're almost there, by the disobedience of Adam, we were made sinners. Well, is there any synergism in that? Did you have to believe that to be made a sinner? Even so, by the obedience of Christ, the faithfulness of Christ, we're made righteous. How can it be that the Christian community has made that man's work Rises above what Christ did. That, it, that, man, that it's man's work instead of Christ's finished work. Do we really believe that God is working in us both the will and to do of his good pleasure? Do we really believe that? Or, or do we just kind of brush through those words, skip across those words without really thinking about it? That the choice is yours. I can't believe it. That is another gospel. That's the gospel that terrifies me. 
people who are willing to admit that God never gave them the choice that as to whether or not they would be a boy or a girl, he never gave them the choice as to which country that they would be born in and, and be a citizen of, though he, though he never gave them the choice whether they would survive childhood or not, he never gave them the choice of their parents, of what parents that they were going to be born from. They may be bad, they may be wonderful. Never had any of those choices, but you can choose whether you go to heaven or hell. Staggering. If I have the ability to make that important a decision, well, then I well, look, I should have the I think I should have the ability to make some less important ones. You know, like uh like you know, I would have rather been born in the old west and ride, you know, a shotgun on a stagecoach. And yet Somehow, modern Christianity has it all based on you. I tell you, it is a revelation of the finished work of Christ. If it's something that you do, Christ's faithfulness is meaningless. And the promise that we've just been studying, that we should be, be heir of the world, a covenant made with Abraham and his seed. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. All of that is rendered meaningless and annulled if it's based on anything you do. That is what the text is teaching. You know, for some man, you know, to walk down or to the front and say, well, how can I be saved? And the minister say, well, step one is, is to get that cigarette pack out of your shirt pocket is, is heresy. It's heresy. And he drops that pack of cigarettes in the waste bin and the crowd just cheers with joy. You may call that Christianity, folks. You may call that Christianity. To me, it is worse than heresy. Let him be accursed. I don't want to be accursed. The underlying presupposition is that you can't keep the law. That there's no exception. The law always works wrath. Why? Why? Because you always break the law. Unknown to lots of people and lots of Bible teachers, apparently, verse 15 is a strong statement of the total depravity of man. Man who cannot hear the word of God. Man who cannot do the word of God. Man who cannot come to God. All of the marks of total depravity because the law works wrath. It's a present tense, by the way. It always works wrath, which means it's always broken. That's the strong underlying presupposition of verse 15, because man is unable to keep the law. Our relationship to God is one of grace, not of debt. And yet, modern Christianity wants to make it a debt. The great, strong, emotional, missionary appeal is, is, is think of the millions who've never heard of Christ throughout their they're out there dying every day without Christ. Don't you want to go tell them? I mean, really tugs at the heartstrings.
folks, I am not opposed to missionary zeal nor missionary activity. I believe one goes to the mission field because he loves Christ, not because souls are going to hell. But the underlying assumption that they make is that those people are not totally depraved. If, if they just heard they could do something to remedy their lost condition. It would, so it would depend, first of all, upon the missionary going to, to say it, and secondly, upon these people hearing it and receiving it, and then finally, finally, upon God. Don't you believe God when he says he is working in his own, both to will and to do of his good pleasure? I'm not telling any missionary to stay home. I believe in missionary activity. But I believe the message that they should be bringing is the same message you're hearing me preach now. And in all truth, nowadays, I mean, the Internet is our mission field. And believe it or not, we are reaching God's people with the good news of his grace, which is why, and we consider it an act of worship on the part of God's people. We desperately need your support to continue forward in taking a crucial stand against a world religious system that has turned the gospel 180 degrees away from Christ toward man. I, I, I myself, I've given money to support missionary service. I believe, I believe in biblical missionary activity. The missionary says, woe is me if I don't preach the good news. Every missionary that's ever told me that he's going to the field to save souls, when I push him in the corner, finally, he has to admit that there's one soul out there going to hell because he didn't say anything. I don't have time to sleep. I, I don't have time to eat or anything else. I got to go look for that one poor soul who may go to hell because I didn't do something. Listen, dearly beloved, our God knows his own and he is faithful. Nothing, nothing in human responsibility or human works has anything to do with our redemption. I asked the question on our Facebook page. And some of the replies I received were greatly troubling. The gospel today is no less unpopular than it was in our Lord's day. Perhaps now even more so. You know, and it hurts me for people to say, well, what he's preaching is, is a Christian doesn't, doesn't have any responsibility. Folks, he has all of the responsibilities of sonship. The only responsibility he has never had that no one nobody's ever had is to become God's child. No more than you had the responsibility to become your parent's child. You did not have that choice. You never did. 
Why do you think that the Holy Spirit wrapped this reality up in the term new birth, born from above? He did so that even so that even a child can understand it. The problem is not with our intellect. Not at all. The problem is that we choose to fall in step with the masses, believing something just because it makes sense from a human standpoint, or because everyone else is believing it, or because that's what my parents believed, or on and on it goes. God set it up this way. No, we're God's children, and as God's children, we have immense responsibilities, tremendous responsibilities. We look at them as we meet them verse by verse in the Word of God. The problem is modern Christianity has extended those responsibilities into redemption, and that is the work of Christ, which he did alone. He himself did. It belongs to him. Unto him be all the glory, now and forever. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, thanks again for the time you've given us just to think about your word, to meet together, to fellowship together in your word. I just ask that the Holy Spirit would strip away all foolishness, but seal only that which is truth, to our hearts, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. This is Steve. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for watching.